So now on to the best part of the next 15 minutes is Gurmuk. So Gurmuk Khalsa is here and she is incredible. Um, can I just leave it at that, you're incredible? She has been teaching yoga for over 47 years. She is traveling all over the world and her heart is with some orphanages in India and she's doing a lot of kids work there. She's open to support and involvement in that project. And she's actually leaving tomorrow to head to India. Um, she just got back from South Africa. So we were so fortunate to have her come down here and make time for us um, and to share words with you. So from womb through the entire lifespan with a passion for kids um, and teaching, teaching kids this practice. Gurmuk is fantastic, incredible, amazing, wordless. So thank you for being here and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much. She's amazing. <laughs> Having just returned shortly back from South Africa, where we did a teacher's training, and we um, have a project there. It's called Rosie's Kitchen. One woman, kids were passing her home, a black woman, and they looked hungry. They were on their way to school. And she said, you kids need something to eat? I said, yeah, ma'am. She fed them. Next day more, next day more, next day more. 250 to 300 children pass her house in the morning and at night, and she feeds them. When we heard about Rosie, I wanted to go out and meet her in a township, and we did. She's a grandma, and she said, I said, Rosie, how, how did you even think to do it? And she says, I asked myself, who else is going to do it? And I said, it's me. And so she began. And it built, the numbers it built, we got word, we built, we raised money for big pots, and now there's a yoga center in Cape Town, Good Around Us Yoga Center, and through them, and through many people like you, through PayPal, we support this project. And she came and spoke to our teacher's training there, and she brought her grandkids, and it was just so amazing how one woman just took it on and, and just feeds these kids for the last 25 years. And she said to herself, I asked myself, I said, who's going to do it? I looked out there, and I said, me. And now she has help. She has helpers come in. We're able to support, and she'll call the ashram and just say, I need 100 sacks of rice, or I need more beans, and now we're able to get more fruits and vegetables to these kids. And then the parents will come after if there's food left. But I bring up this story, and many of you know stories such as this all over the world, where people ask themselves, who's going to do it? And they said, it's me. <laughs> I could tell story after story. Prabhu, she has an orphanage that we help support in India. She got about 250 kids there. And again, the question, who's going to do it? Me. So I ask all of you, who's going to do it? You are. We are. Because who else? Call upon the government? I don't think so. Call upon the pharmaceuticals? I don't think so. We are the ones that we've been looking for. We're right here in this room. And it's so amazing, the power that we have, not individually, but collectively. And so Rosie, we heard of her. And then Good Ram Dash Yoga Center started helping. And then our teachers training. So it's a worldwide project. Because one woman started it, like all the programs that you started in your cities and in your countries. In South Africa, which I really, really love, and it gets like, a lot of bad press, which a lot of places do, but if you go live with the people, one expression that stays with me forever when I come back from that place, I've 
journey there quite a few times, is if you say to someone in a shop or someone serves you food, you say, thank you so much. Do you know what they say? They say, pleasure. They don't say, it's my pleasure or it's a pleasure. They have one long word, pleasure. And that word has stayed with me forever. And so when you talk to people, when you greet people, when you see children, just say, pleasure. When I come back from India, I'm so used to, when you greet and meet someone, you go like this. And so I'm going through the airport, right? <laughs> and I'm so used to doing this. <laughs> that you start doing this to the, to the people who are checking your baggage and everything. And at first, they don't know what you're doing. But somehow, it's a heart-to-heart -heart connection, even though they can't verbally put it together. So I wanted to share one story with you that maybe will go back to why we're all here, why we're teaching children, and why my lover, you might say, my deepest mission that came from my teacher, Yogi Bhajan, was pregnancy prenatal. Like to catch, to catch the mamas before, to simply say, before the egg and sperm met, to have conscious conception. And then that in utero life, those nine months. So oftentimes it's been thought of, oh, they're just cute. It's a boy, it's a girl. I'll paint the room pink or blue and you know, get all the, and we get the bundle of joy and death. They have a, a live human being that the cells are dividing. But they're dividing through the thoughts, through the actions, through the food, through the music, through everything that a mother does. That's who that child is. And if we can help change consciousness in utero through mama, we will bring peace on this earth. If a mama can understand that her prejudices, her mental state will go into that child. Do you know when a child is born and as they develop, they take on their mother's breath? Kind of scary, isn't it? So your mama's afraid. She doesn't know anything. She doesn't know she wants to get pregnant. She hears it's a boy and she wishes it was a girl. All that is fed into her mind, into the womb. And then we teach them yoga at an early, early age, and they can change those patternings. But for myself, if we can just start before that egg and sperm even come together at the true beginning. But we pick a child up no matter where they are and who they are. And we all can tell stories. We could write a book bigger than any book in the world, are the stories that we know that has changed not just the life of the child, but the life of the family, the life of the community. To me, in 1969, 1970, in the 60s, no one even knew before that what yoga was. No one knew the difference between yoga and yogurt. True, we didn't. There was Richard Hittleman on the TV, that little teeny box. What yoga has done, it will bring peace on this earth. Because there's one commonality we all have. What's that one commonality? Breath. No one can sell breath, buy stocks in breath. No country can own breath. No religion can own breath. No gender, sexual preference, anything. No one can own breath. It's a public commodity that we all have, and when we don't have it, we're not in the body. Tell me one other thing on this planet that has a commonality, and we can't live without it. And through breath brings consciousness, and through consciousness will change the world. It's a guarantee. It's a guarantee. But it takes every one of you, and many, many more, to catch than when they're little. It's harder when you're 40 to change your patterns. We all know that. And imagine, just imagine this. I was teaching in, in LA right before I left, and out of 50, 60 people, 
There were five ch children in the room. It was adult yoga, kundalini yoga. And I asked the children, did your parents tell you you had to come because there was no babysitter? And they said, no, this one girl, she looked like she was from another planet. She was nine years old, this beamy face. And she said, no, I wanted to come. And then I found all five of those children throughout the years had been in our Kalsaway prenatal, the mamas. And the mamas had done the yoga in utero. And when a child comes out, I have kids that are 30 years old now, because I've been teaching like about 31 years after my daughter was born, who they become yoga teachers. They meditate. Because what you learn in womb life is what you carry on in life. There's a great story. It was given to me, actually, many years ago. It's a story of a Native American, and he's in New York City. He's with a friend of New York City, and they're in noontime rush hour in Midtown. And it's very noisy, as you all know. Traffic, fire alarms, sirens, people talking, walking, dogs barking, everything. It's commotional. And he says, do you hear that cricket? And his friend from New York says, a cricket, you must be crazy. A cricket? He says, yeah, watch. He walks over to a, a little garden in front of a, a business building. And he says, see? There's a cricket. And his New Yorker busy friend, how, how did you hear that cricket? And he says, watch. He walks along, he takes all the change out of his pocket, and he drops it. Everyone stops because they think it's their pocket. They go like this. They think it's their change that fell to the ground. They all heard the change. And he says, it depends on what you're listening to. And it brings us back to meditation. That if children can come to know there's an inner life, there's an inner voice, there's an inner knowingness that they can trust, and it's their anchor, because nobody can control. We read what happened in Paris. Nobody control the outside environment. The only source of truth, of sanity, of life is on the inside. You have to have a home to return to. And if these children at an early age, through yoga, through meditation, through in utero life, can find a home to return to, there's the foundation of which they can live. And when we all find that home, that foundation, that anchor, there's peace on earth. Haven't I gone 15 minutes already? No? Where's my little two minutes left? Oh, wow. OK. I'm going to teach you one, one minute. It's really a three-minute meditation. But let's bring our right hand above our heart and our left hand just about at our belly. This one, teach. Teach old people. Teach people in, in schools. Teach pregnant. Teach neighbors. Teach grocers. Teach people on the street. It doesn't matter. And it goes like this. The distance stays the same between. Close your eyes. Roll them up to that place where all knowledge is contained at your third eye point. Inhale up like your arms are floating beyond your mental control and exhaling down, keeping the same distance. Thirty more seconds. Let the breath be so deep. Mm -hmm. 
Now inhale, take it up to your third eye. In the same way, exhale back down to your navel. Hmm. We only did it for one minute. Imagine three minutes. Feel good, right? That's how fast this stuff works, and anyone can do this. I'm going to ask Christian to come up because Debbie Kaminsky, our famous Debbie from Newark, New Jersey, she said, you got to end with May the Long Time Sun. And I'm going to bring Christian up here. Many of you know her, Yoga for Youth. She just got back from Ghana and Togo. She's quite a woman, and she's quite a singer. And some of you have heard her sing. But she's going to sing May the Long Time Sun, and we're all going to sing it with her. She's just shaking her head and saying, why would you do this to me? And then she sings like an angel. <laughs> I can always count on good enough to put me on the spot. <laughs> yes, I did just get back from West Africa, and I'm still landing. But my voice is still down in there somewhere. Well, if you're all familiar with this song, it's really a prayer. And like you think of someone right now that you'd like to send this blessing to and bring your hands together at your heart center either in prayer pose or just cover your heart and I'll do a call and answer just in case some of you don't know the song may the long time sunshine upon you your turn All love surround you. chant that now. Sat now. Let there be peace, love, light, joy, and grace to all. Sat now. <laughs> Did it again. Thank you, Michelle.